Hello and welcome to Schedule School Seminar 2. Uh, my name is Oliver May. I'm a personal injury and clinical negligence barrister from Number 5 Chambers. And I'm Karen Hunt, a barrister at Outer Temple Chambers. Today we have two guests with us who are going to help us prepare a schedule of laws for care and case management. Ben Bradley is a barrister at Outer Temple Chambers and one of OTC's resident schedule whisperers. He is a leading junior and acts for both claimants and defendants in high value catastrophic injury claims. Anna Hyam is a top rated senior associate at Stewart's and also acts in complex and high value catastrophic injury claims. Anna and Ben have both acted on a number of cases together. Um, recently, they successfully represented the claimant at trial in the case of UNAS, which was included in Mr. Justice Poole's clinical negligence blog as one of the top five ClidNeg cases of 2019. And they have recovered in excess of £20 million for clients over their time working together. So they are well placed to take us through today's seminar. So just to give a brief introduction, uh, Schedule School is a free resource hosted by junior practitioners and of course guided by senior practitioners. Everything that you see today will be uploaded to the website. Once complete, it will be a guide for junior practitioners taking schedules one step at a time and we will look at some of the key heads of loss. Most importantly, it's interactive. The worksheets are available on the website and the best way to use this resource is to work through it yourself. If you haven't watched seminar one yet, you might want to do that before joining us for this seminar. Uh, in seminar one, we looked at the purposes of a schedule, some of the key calculations that are involved and in using the Ogden tables. And we also looked at how to split a multiplier, which is going to be relevant for today. I should say before we begin that schedule school is for guidance only any schedule is going to turn on the facts of an individual case and so we can't cover every eventuality in these sessions as such nothing in this seminar constitutes legal advice in seminar two we're going to look at calculating claims for care and case management and we're still considering the case of Penny Foster. The facts of her case are available on the website. And I would suggest that you refresh your memory um, before watching the rest of this seminar, because of course, Penny's care is going to depend on those facts. But in brief, Penny is now 37 years old. She suffered a serious spinal cord injury in a road traffic accident in March, 2019, and is now in a wheelchair. After the accident, Penny spent four months in a spinal rehab centre. She was unable to move back home to her terrace house upon discharge because it wasn't suitable for her needs. So at the moment, she's renting an accessible bungalow and continuing with therapy. We're preparing this schedule for a joint settlement meeting to take place on the 1st of September 2021. Read the background facts, read them and understand them and have them to hand for context as we go through. A few other things to have to hand for this session. You might want your facts and figures as always a calculator. And also up on the website, we have Penny's care plan kindly drafted by Anna um, and a work schedule of loss for Penny in Excel format so that you can look at the entire schedule in that format as well as the close-ups that are gonna be on the slides as we get started. So without further ado, um, Anna, thank you and welcome. Um, let's get started and I'll load up the slides for seminar two. Anna, could you please take us through the agenda for today's seminar? Yes, we will touch upon the foundation legal principles of care claims today, particularly the key consideration of reasonableness, but the main focus will be on taking you through an example schedule of loss. We will break it down into subsections, which are past care, including both gratuitous and paid care, future care, and we set out various commercial care examples, which get more complicated as Penny ages. And we couldn't let Dan Herman have all the fun in webinar one, so we're also going to be splitting some more multipliers today to allow for the fact that Penny would like to have children in the future and will need increased care and assistance when she does. We will then explain the role of a case manager and show you the calculations for past and future case management. 
finally, we'll touch upon how to express claims for care and case management as periodical payments rather than as a lump sum. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. And in terms of the aims for this seminar, what can the audience expect to get out of this? As you said, Karen, I have prepared a skeleton expert care report for Penny. Um, I've provided minimal narrative and just focused on the costings of the regimes that the expert is recommending so that we can show you how to take these figures and from there set out in a schedule the cost of someone's lifelong care needs. The amount of information in a care report can be overwhelming, but hopefully at the end of this webinar, you will feel much more confident about turning this care report into this schedule of loss. And on this slide, this is the summary page of your schedule where the total claims for each head of loss is set out, added together, and at the bottom of the page is the total amount we'll be claiming for penny expressed as a lump sum. As I've said, we'll talk about periodical payments later on. Um, and you'll see on the summary that today's topic, care and case management is highlighted blue. And as this is the first head of loss to be explored in schedule school, I've just made up some figures for the other heads of loss for illustrative purposes. Brilliant, thanks very much, Anna. So before we go into the details of care claims uh, and look at the calculations that we'll need to perform uh, for a complete schedule of loss, Ben, could you give us uh, the big picture, please, on, um, on care claims? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, a care claim can be anything from um, quantifying a bit of help that relatives might have given to a claimant whilst recovering from a relatively short-term injury, um, all the way through to setting up um, highly specialised uh, commercial nursing packages um, that will enable a claimant who's been severely injured to continue to maintain their dignity, uh, maintain their independence in varying degrees, um, and often of crucial importance, ensure that that individual can continue to live in their own home. Um, on, on those larger claims, um, care is obviously a big ticket, if not the big ticket item. Um, naturally, it is of crucial importance to the claimant, and because it's a big ticket item, it's an item that's always subject to a high degree of scrutiny, uh, both by um, the other side um, and ultimately the judge at trial. Now, speaking of the judge, uh, how, how will a judge go about quantifying a care claim at trial? Well, the core legal concept that cuts across really all judicial decisions on quantum is the concept of um, reasonableness. Um, uh, we've set out some of the core um, legal authorities on the slide for you to um, pause and uh, read at your leisure. Um, but the core points are these really. Um, any care claim is not a race to the bottom. And what I mean by that is a claimant is not obliged to go for the cheapest option available. Uh, provided that that claimant can demonstrate that their care package is reasonable, uh, that claimant should succeed in recovering um, the care package they seek. Um, the focus is very much on the claimant's needs and their function. Um, the court looks at whether, in that context, the care model is reasonable um, in the context of um, the 100% principle of compensation. That is to say, uh, the ability to put the claimant in so far as the court is able, of course that can be difficult in certain catastrophic injury cases, in the position that he or she was in uh, prior to the index accident. Um, often that can really mean um, use, utilizing the care regime uh, to enable a claimant um, to do more. Um, and provided that the costs are reasonable and not outlandish, uh, ordinarily in those circumstances, the claimant will recover. Thanks very much, Ben. Alec, can I ask, from the claimant's perspective, other than drafting a great schedule of loss, as you and Ben have done for us, what is your top tip for maximising the cost of recovery when it comes to a care claim? Well, a great schedule is the pinnacle of years of work. The schedule is only ever going to be as good as the evidence, and the evidence gathering takes a long time. The starting point is the witness statements. 
for more detail about the claimant's daily routines, what assistance she gets and from whom, the limitations her injury places on her, what she aspires to do but currently can't, etc. The more the care expert has to go on when formulating his or her recommendations. Then if you have been able to secure a sizable interim payment for your client, you can take the next step, which is to get a case manager on board and start trialing different care regimes. You will then have the care records and the witness evidence from the case manager to show what has worked and just as importantly, what has not worked. And all this goes towards building the case for the care regime as pleaded in the schedule. The more evidence and support, the more compelling the schedule. And as Ben says, the less likely a judge is to consider what is claimed to be unreasonable. And Ben, from the defendant's perspective, when getting together your counter schedule in respect of course for care and case management, what is your key piece of advice? Again, uh, be guided by the legal um, framework. Um, my approach in any counter schedule is to adopt a stance of reasonableness um, because it is very difficult for a claimant to argue against a wholly reasonable position. So, uh, again, at the risk of repetition, a counter schedule is not a race uh, to the bottom. Um, it, it's uh, much more credible to adopt a reasonable line, but then stick to it. Um, and, and that's the approach I tend to take, and I find that the very best um, leading counsel in the business take uh, when they um, are representing defendants at roundtable meetings in these catastrophic cases. So just as we would in our schedule, um, let's start by looking at past losses, and in particular, let's start with gratuitous care. Now, before we get to our calculations for Penny specifically, Ben, I think it's it's fair to say, isn't it, that it's it's not just as simple as claiming for every hour that every family member is put in in providing care. Um, can you please uh, explain the principles that underpin claims for gratuitous care? Yeah, well, Ollie, there are, there are two short points, really. Um, the first point is this, that um, the claim for past gratuitous care is a claim brought by the claimant, but on trust um, on behalf of um, those caregivers. Um, and that's illustrated um, by the fact that if you're ever asked to prepare an approval advice, uh, as counsel, you'll ordinarily be asked to um, apportion the amount of the claimant's damages uh, that needs to be ring-fenced for um, gratuitous um, care. Um, similarly, if a claimant, in fact, is not going to give the money back to the um, caregivers, well, then in theory, uh, they are not entitled to claim uh, gratuitous care on, on their behalf. So it's, it's important that SLIS is also... Um, take instructions on that point and understand the importance of, of the claim being brought on trust. Um, the second point is that um, really the claim is valued as if that um, care was provided commercially uh, by those um, caregivers, um, albeit, and this is the crucial difference, uh, less a discount for gratuitous receipt. Um, we often call that um, the Housecroft uh, discount, uh, surprise, surprise, after a case uh, called Housecroft, um, but it's, it's usually um, 25%. That's the appropriate rate. Um, some claimants try and be clever and they say it's 10%. Some defendants try and be equally clever and say it's 33%. But it's not. It's 25%. And that roughly uh, equates to uh, what you would have to pay a commercial caregiver in tax and national insurance. Of course, because you're not paying um, Aunt Doris um, uh, commercially you're simply not paying tax and national insurance and any care that she might uh, provide uh, to you. Uh, so that's why the discount is uh, what it is. And Ben, looking at the two cases we have on screen now, Hunt and Severs and Housecroft, which you mentioned, um, what do they tell us about certain traps or limitations to look out for when pleading gratuitous care? Um, yeah, there are two really small pitfalls that can sometimes um, catch people out uh, early on in practice. Um, the rule in Hunt and Severs um, is a straightforward one. Um, you can't claim gratuitous care if the defendant was, in fact, the provider of care. Um, so you often see that in cases where um, perhaps um, one spouse has been driving um, the other spouse as a passenger in a vehicle um, and the spouse ends up uh, being um, the cause of the accident and thus becomes the defendant. In, in those circumstances, you, you can't claim 
uh, gratuitous um, care that might have been uh, provided by um, the spouse that was driving. Um, the um, second point um, comes from the case of um, Housecroft that sets out quite a bit in respect of gratuitous care, but it, it's, it's this, um, that your claim for gratuitous care is usually capped um, at the ceiling rate for um, commercial care. Um, and this can often um, arise where um, a highly paid individual has for entirely understandable reasons, given up work to look after their injured relative. Um, and, and the courts in, in Housecroft, some may think, take quite a harsh approach there. They say, well, there may well be emotional reasons as to why you've uh, given up your highly paid uh, job, um, but the defendant shouldn't have to pay for that. Um, ultimately, um, you could have bought in care on a commercial basis um, at a, a cheaper um, rate. Um, and so you can't claim your full loss of earnings as a caregiver. Uh, the claim for care is limited to what a commercial uh, carer would cost. And that's sometimes referred to as the house croft ceiling. Thanks, Ben. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. Um, let's get into the numbers, shall we? Um, Ben, could you talk us through uh, the calculations or rather the particular issues that are on this slide? Yeah, um, so um, this really sort of rounds it all off. Um, how do you calculate um, gratuitous um, care? Uh, well, you really need three inputs. Um, the first thing is to work out um, the number of um, hours of care that that caregiver has provided. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the second is the selection of the correct hourly um, rate. And then the third factor is the housecroft discount that um, we spoke about a few moments uh, ago. Um, so um, going through the first of those uh, three issues, uh, the number of hours of care. Well, um, how long is a piece of string? Um, no one, of course, uh, starts um, a stopwatch and times to the minute or the hour. Uh, the amount of care that they might be providing to a loved one in circumstances where um, lives are often in turmoil and tipped upside down as a result of these accidents. Um, so what it really is, is a good guesstimate as to what um, these caregivers uh, might have been providing in terms of care. Um, but you, you can hone that um, down slightly. Um, sometimes um, in a larger case, your care expert will do that uh, for you. Um, and um, then you've got um, their opinion as to the likely input um, on a plate. Um, in smaller cases, um, you've kind of got to do it yourself, um, but you'll, you'll get a feel over time as to uh, what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. Um, there'll usually be an awful lot of input um, in those cases um, in the witness statement. So, so from solicitor's perspective, really important to get as much detail as you can um, in that quantum evidence about precisely what loved ones were doing, uh, why they were doing it, the sorts of tasks. And as we'll come on to when I talk about hourly rate, uh, when they were doing it, that's also a crucial question. Um, and so I'll move on to hourly rates um, now. Um, re relevant table is in facts and figures. Um, that gives um, the National Joint Council pay scales for care at spinal column point um, eight. Uh, we don't really need to get into the technicalities of, of, of that today, uh, thankfully. But as I said earlier, they're basically the, the typical commercial rates for care. And you'll see in that table um, that care rates are set out at what we call the basic rate. That's essentially daytime care in the weekday. Um, then a different rate for evenings, um, a different rate again. Um, for the weekends, Saturday being a little bit cheaper than Sunday. And then you've got two further um, pretty um, clever, uh, helpful tables, one called the aggregate rate and another one called the day aggregate rate. Um, the day aggregate rate um, is simply a combination of care given across seven days a week, but not including nighttime care. The aggregate rate is the same principle but it includes um, night care. Um, why is that important? Well, um, when I started at the bar for years, uh, claimants would claim um, the aggregate rate and, and often actually get away with it. It's amazing how often you turn up to a round table meeting and, and you wouldn't be challenged on it. Um, but that's not actually the right approach because in um, low to medium value claims, it was very unlikely that um, uh, a caregiver will in fact be providing care um, 
at night. Um, indeed, there, there are some, some cases, um, Noble and Owens being one example, um, another case which I was involved called Downing and Peter NHS Trust, uh, that, make, that, that indicate that um, the aggregate rate, including night care, is really reserved for the most serious of cases. Um, but because of that, there's now another tool um, in a claimant's box, and that's just to um, apply the day aggregate rate. Uh, and you may find that that um, is a more appropriate rate to use in certain cases. Of course, if you're acting for a defendant and you see the aggregate rate still uh, pleaded, well, um, you can really go to town on that. Um, and rely on Noble and Owens, rely on Downing and, and, and uh, plead that that rate is uh, simply uh, not appropriate. Brilliant, thank you. So now that we have uh, an insight into what it is we're doing when we're calculating past gratuitous care, let's look at Penny's case, let's look at a schedule um, and see how we're going to translate this into our Excel spreadsheet. Um, Okay, Anna, can you take us through what's on this slide? Yes, this slide is simply a screenshot of what your spreadsheet might look like when you are actually in Excel preparing it yourself. Um, I want you just to note the bottom tabs where it says front sheet, summary, past care and case management, appendix one, multipliers and future care and case management, just to show that each head of loss will have its own tab in your Excel document. Great, thank you. Um, and in this case, let's look at Penny, let's look at her past gratuitous care. And Anna, if you could explain to us how you calculated this and how you lay it out in this schedule, um, which here we've got in Appendix 1. Yes, you will recall from webinar one, Dan advocating the use of appendices, and I completely agree. I've used an appendix for Penny, even though Penny's calculation is very simple because it's good practice to get used to siphoning off these calculation tables into an appendix and then just drawing the total claims back into the main body of the schedule. So Penny's care expert has calculated how many hours worth of gratuitous care has been provided to Penny since her injury. The provision is likely to fluctuate. If someone's an inpatient, they will need less input from their family than when they first go home. And then for the first few months back at home, the family might be on hand 24 seven, and then it might level out only to spike again if the claimant gets ill. So the care report will divide the time periods and the amount of care up accordingly. There might also be multiple people providing care to the claimant in which case they would probably have a calculation table each in the appendix. But Penny's claim is simple. It is split into only three time periods on the basis that just one person has been providing this gratuitous care to her. So there's her four months in inpatient rehabilitation, a time at home from July 2019 to the end of March 2020, and then from the 1st of April 2020, to the date of the schedule, which we have said is the 1st of February, 2021. So all you have to do is follow the time periods laid out by the care expert. So as you can see from the um, screenshot on this slide, in the first row of your table, you copy over the numbers. So four hours a day for 122 days, is 488 hours in total, multiply that by the hourly rate, and then that gives you the total claim for Penny's inpatient period. And you do exactly the same for the next two time periods. One thing to look out for is the hourly rate increasing. You will find the details on page 384 of the current Facts and Figures book, this uh, lovely silver one for their jubilee. Uh, <laughs> Facts and Figures always has a table of the National Joint Council pay scales dating back to 1998 and bringing you up to date. And the increases usually apply from the 1st of April. So just make sure when you're doing your uh, calculations that you apply the correct hourly rate for the time period claim. So okay. that's the appendix. So on the next slide, yeah. you will see that we're back to the main body of the 
schedule. And you'll see that the claim for past gratuitous care will comprise mainly narrative. You can read this slide at your leisure to see how you may choose to word this section. Uh, I would suggest that you insert some pithy narrative without copying huge swathes of the care report or the witness statements. Then say that the calculations as per the care experts report are set out in the appendix. You only then need to pull through the total from the appendix apply the house crop discount and the section of the schedule for past gratuitous care will actually be quite short. Only deducted 15% for gratuitous care. Our back to basics webinar is not the place to go into details and I don't think anyone needs to see Ben and I arguing over this. Uh, I agree with Ben, the house crop dis discount will usually be 25% and it almost certainly would be in, in pennies. But there are exceptional cases with strong evidence for a lower deduction. And if you have one of those cases, which I will remind Ben that he and I did, uh, it is worth pleading. So I only um, put that into Penny's um, schedule here just to flag that up as a point of consideration for you. An example of where council thinks he's right and that, of course, is, is corrected. <laughs> Uh, by his more knowledgeable instructing solicitor. Um, and, and it emphasizes the teamwork approach that works so well in these larger claims. Finally, for those of you less familiar with Excel, I have set out on the next slide how to pull information from one tab into the next. I would suggest that you pause the webinar here, open an Excel spreadsheet, create two tabs, and follow the directions set out on the slide and see for yourself how it works. And I think that will be more effective than me simply explaining how to do it now. Brilliant, thanks Anna. Um, so there what we've done is we've looked at how the past gratuitous care course break down hour per hour, how they're gonna look on our summary sheet. Um, and also here, we're looking at how to actually manipulate the figures in Excel. Um, briefly, Anna, then in terms of any past paid care that Penny received, how do we put that into our schedule? Now, this should be a very simple uh, process. If you have employed the good practice as explained by Demi in webinar one, and you've been keeping a rolling file of care and case management invoices. You simply list all the invoices in your appendix and pull the total through into the schedule. In this schedule, you'll see I've added a third column into the appendix titled invoice. And then I've ticked if an invoice is appended to the schedule. In claims that have been running for years, there are inevitably going to be receipts and invoices that can't be located. Sometimes the claimant might be able to prove that a payment was made by reference to a bank statement, and sometimes the claimant may have to estimate. This third column won't be necessary in all schedules, but I added it in here as an option for you, as it is easier for both sides and the court to see at a glance which items have a corresponding invoice and which do not. Finally, with regards to past care, there is a very important point which is easy to overlook. We are preparing Penny Schedule on the 1st of February 2021 and serving it ahead of a joint settlement meeting on the 1st of September 2021. This schedule anticipates that the claim will settle on the 1st of September 2021. Any losses incurred prior to the 1st of September are deemed to be past losses. So you'll see that the 1st of February to the 1st of September is a sort of no man's land. These losses haven't happened yet, but they are claimed as past losses. And if you forget to claim them, you would be depriving Penny of seven months of compensation, which she needs to meet the costs of her care. How you claim them depends on Penny's circumstances, if Penny's care arrangements are established and the care expert thinks that they will continue as they are until after the case has settled, one option is to take the average monthly cost of her current care regime and multiply it by seven. And you'll see that that is how I have claimed it in the example. Of course, Penny suffered a very serious injury um, 
and it's resulted in life-changing injuries that need lifelong care. And in that circumstance, um, the plan will usually be the provision of commercial care rather than relying solely on gratuitous care. So a new set of considerations are going to come into play and a care expert report will really be a vital piece of evidence for us to rely on. It's also important to note and something that we've touched on a bit already, it, which is that a catastrophically injured person's future care requirements are likely to change over time as their symptoms either improve or worsen or as comorbidities or age take effect. And so it's likely, as in Penny's case and as can be seen in her care expert report, that the course of care are going to be different throughout different phases of Penny's life, depending on what she needs. That's going to require us to split multipliers, which, as Anna said, is something we touched on in seminar one, if you need to go back and remind yourself. The starting point for calculating future commercial care uh, depends really on which care model you're going to be using for a given phase. Ben, could you tell us about uh, an agency care model, please? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, an agency care model is, um, you'll all be pleased to know, the most straightforward of the um, commercial care models. Um, it can, though not always, um, also be um, the most expensive. And that's why you'll find there's often a debate about whether an agency model is appropriate or whether alternatively in certain cases, uh, whether a claimant should look to hire um, his carers um, directly. That's often called a direct hire or an employed model. Um, you might want to think about the appropriateness of a care regime as being a little bit like a, a bell curve that um, depends somewhat on the severity of injury. So at the very lowest end of the scale, um, a short-term injury that resolves, um, gratuitous care is likely to be uh, the most appropriate model. Um, there are then those cases in the um, middle where it might not wor be worth the um, expense, or to be frank about it, um, faff, um, of maintaining um, a direct hire model. Um, and indeed, agency care might be uh, more efficient in those circumstances. Um, some examples are where a, a, an individual perhaps needs just a cleaner or some domestic assistance, or in a brain injury case uh, where there might be some ad hoc um, buddy assistance throughout the week. Um, when you come to the catastrophic claims, well, um, you end up with a very often with a, with a hybrid type model. Um, Agency care can be a really good way of getting a care regime in place quickly because you can just go to an agency um, and um, it's not as easy as this. Um, but with the click of the fingers and a lot of hard work, uh, they can assemble the team uh, to, to come into the claimant's home and provide uh, what is required. Um, it's also really flexible. Um, so that gives you, um, particularly as um, a claimant set of solicitors um, and legal team, the opportunity to try different models see what works, see what doesn't work with this individual um, claimant. Um, however, doing that is necessarily um, very expensive um, because um, the agency takes a cut um, of, of, of any um, hourly rate that um, the claimant is claiming with the remainder going to, um, to, to the carers thereafter. And so in most cases, you will look perhaps to trial regimes on an agency basis to start off with um, and then move towards direct hire in due course. And um, indeed, that's exactly what um, uh, Penny's care expert has recommended as, as we'll see in due course. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule. Um, in, in certain cases, you may well be able to justify agency care on a lifelong basis. Um, that may well be in circumstances where for various reasons, there's um, likely to be a um, high turnover of um, care staff. Um, you may well evidence that simply by uh, what's happened in, in the past and the difficulty of retaining care staff in a certain geographical location. Um, or in certain circumstances, such as a case I had recently, um, I, I had a claimant with particularly um, profound behavioural issues. Um, and, and to be frank about it, it was very difficult for those carers to uh, remain in post um, long term because um, the job was um, difficult and, and, and stressful for them. And so um, in those circumstances where you need a high turnover of, of rolling care staff, an agency model can on occasions be um, appropriate. Thanks, Ben. Um, and as you've said there, 
for Penny, for up until age 40, our care expert has recommended an agency care model. So we're going to look at how to calculate the course of that. But before we get into it, um, briefly, here are the multipliers that are going to be relevant when we're looking at all of those different phases. The first one being that agency care phase. Um, Anna, do you want to just briefly explain what's on our screen? Yes, like you said, this is the multipliers page. And you also have reminded everyone that uh, Dan showed you the table 36 method for calculating Penny's lifetime multiplier in webinar one. And he then showed you how to split her multipliers for periods of care. Um, ben and I, uh, for continuity, have adopted um, the time periods decided on by Dan, and that's how we've uh, divided up the care report. I strongly recommend a separate tab in the schedule for multipliers, and I will show you why at the end of the webinar. Essentially, it's to make life easier for yourself if you have to make any changes to the multipliers further down the line. So the next slide is the calculation for Penny. It is very simple. The care expert recommends agency care for Penny until she's 40 at a cost of £1,350 per week. You simply multiply this by 52 weeks to get your annual cost, which is £70,200, and then you multiply that by your multiplier. On this slide, you will see that I have highlighted the multiplier box, which is D6. If you look to the top of the screenshot where it says equals multipliers exclamation mark G15, you'll see that I did not simply type 1.73 into the multipliers box myself. Instead, I pressed equals, I clicked on the multipliers tab, then I clicked on 1.73 in that multipliers tab which is what pulled the 1.73 multiplier through into the future care tab. It's important you line things up in this way. Um, and like I've said, I will demonstrate why at the end. And it's because if you have to make any changes to the multipliers further down the line, changing it once in your multipliers tab will update your entire schedule. Um, and I'm sorry if this is obvious, but in the total box on your uh, future care page, the total box here is E6. You need to ask the spreadsheet to multiply C6 by D6, rather than doing it on your own calculator and just typing the answer 121,446 into the box yourself. Now, when Penny turns 40, uh, the care expert has recommended a change to direct hire. Ben, could you tell us about the direct hire care model, please? Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's often um, cheaper overall than a catastrophic case. And the main single driver to that is um, the hourly rate, um, because you're no longer paying um, the agency effectively their cut. And so the hourly rate for care reduces um, accordingly, um, often driven by um, geographical circumstances. So you may find that the appropriate hourly rate in London um, and the reasonable hourly rate is higher um, than it might be in um, Kingston-upon-Hull, um, uh, for instance, um, just to take uh, two geographical examples of cases that I've, I've got on my desk at the moment. Um, there are two real um, quirks to um, a direct uh, care model. Um, the first is that there are 60 weeks in a year uh, rather than 52. Um, now that's not um, as odd as it sounds. Um, well, why is that? Well, um, firstly, your, your client uh, needs 24 seven um, care, um, but the reality is, is that these individual carers uh, can't be there at 24 um, seven. Um, the individual carer may fall ill on occasions. Uh, they may, re well, they not may, they will require to, uh, the, to go on holiday. Uh, they will on occasions uh, need um, training. Um, and all of that um, time off uh, needs to be covered effectively by time from another carer. 
Uh, and what you find that happens in reality is, in fact, there's usually a team of about six, seven, possibly eight carers, um, all on a rotor, uh, providing 24-7 care. Um, but that time off, um, the 28 days of holiday per year, um, plus around eight days allowance for sickness, plus additional days away for training, means that if you require one carer um, to uh, provide care on a 24-7 basis, the reality is, is that you will need to pay for about 60 weeks worth of carer time rather than 52 weeks. And so whereas on an agency model where the agency takes responsibility for all of those factors related to employment, and so you can plead this on a 52-week year, um, from an employed model, um, it's 60 weeks. And um, that, that model has been endorsed by various cases, um, the first of which I think was XXX and uh, a strategic health authority, uh, which we've cited there. Um, so remember, 60 weeks in the year, not 52 weeks. Um, second core point is that you need to add in um, all the costs associated with employing um, the carers directly. So that can include uh, national insurance contributions, often seen in care reports as ERNIC, um, pension contributions, uh, running the payroll, um, and, and carers' expenses. Small things such as um, having a sandwich uh, when out on an excursion, uh, with, with, with the claimant, um, so on and so forth. Um, and they all feed into the schedule, um, which um, you'll see uh, when you see our, our example. And looking again at Penny's schedule of loss, uh, how will this look? Well, um, as Anne has been saying all along, the simplest and most straightforward way to do it is to simply uh, mirror the uh, care experts' calculations um, in your version of the um, schedule of loss, much something else, it's as easy then for the uh, defendant and the court to follow why you have come to the figures that you have come to. And so you'll see in the left hand uh, column uh, what the care expert has said about her, the direct care model and the appropriate costings. And then those have been transposed into the schedule, which you see on the right hand side. Uh, so you have um, uh, in line 12, uh, effectively the base costs, which are based on seven hours of care a day at £11 an hour, uh, weekdays going up to £12 an hour, weekends, which the care expert has uh, calculated will cost at £33,180 uh, per annum. Um, and then you add um, those um, uh, additional um, expenses uh, thereafter that I, I talked about. So you've got the two principles there, as you can see, firstly, the 60 uh, week year, um, and secondly, um, the additional expenses associated with employment. Um, you then put those in as your uh, multiple accounts. Um, as Anna's explained, you apply the split multiplier, um, copying it from the uh, multiplier section of your um, schedule, and Excel works all the magic um, for you. And what would otherwise be uh, quite a complicated exercise uh, becomes very straightforward. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I notice that when we look at line 13, we've got national insurance, etc., on £24,756, rather than having it on the full figure for costs we have in line 12 of 33180. Can you explain why there's that difference just in, in broad brush terms? Well, um, the easy answer is you don't need to worry about it too much because um, the care, an experienced care expert uh, we will do the calculation for you. Um, and nine times out of 10, you can take it as read that it's correct. Um, but the, um, the theoretical answer um, is in essence, this is just a tax calculation. And of course, um, everyone has a personal allowance upon which they do not have to pay tax. I think it's the first 10,000 pounds or so at the moment. And so um, the ERMIC at 13.8%, uh, takes into account that personal allowance. So um, you are not um, un uh, undertaking calculations. This is 13.8% of £33,180. It's always going to be um, less than that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right, the next point we want to consider is that Penny would like to have a child. We asked Penny's care expert to address this and she calculated the extra help that Penny's going to need to care for her child as a result of her injuries. That's on the slide in front of you. You can see how the care expert has set it out. Anna, how do we 
looking at this, how do we go from there to our schedule of loss? So you will see that the care expert has created three extra care schedules, which will kick in if Penny has a baby. And this care is above and beyond the direct hire care model that Ben has just talked you through. So the way the care expert has divided up the additional need is the first year of the baby's life, then from age one to four inclusive, which means the whole of the child's fourth year up to the day before its fifth birthday. And then from age five to 14 inclusive, so the whole of the child's 14th year. Now, in order to plead this part of Penny's claim, you are going to have to split some more multipliers. And I have written the methodology onto the next slide. If you want to take some more time over it, uh, pause the webinar here and just have a read through. So what we know is that Penny is going to incur a few years of losses, but the loss isn't going to begin until Penny has a child a few years into the future. To work out these multipliers, you need table A6 in facts and figures. Um, it's on page 42 of this edition. And essentially table A6 has done the hard work for you. Now, hopefully you do have a copy of uh, table A6 in front of you. Um, so you will know what I mean when I say, if you look down the left hand column of the table, it says years of loss. And across the top of the table, it says years before loss starts to run. Childcare losses are as follows. The first year of the child's life. This is one year of loss, but it will not start to run for three years. So on table A6, you would go to the years of loss column, go to one, and then you go across to three years before the loss starts to run, and you will see the number 1.01. And that's the multiplier that you use for the first calculation. The next period of time is from age one to four inclusive. So this is four years of loss and they do not start to run for four years. So in the years of loss column, go down to four, then go across to four years before the loss starts to run and you'll see the number 4.06. That's your multiplier for the second time period. You use the same method for ages five to 14 inclusive. So that is 10 years of loss, which does not start to run for eight years. And the multiplier there is 10.33. So that's how you get the multipliers for the years of childcare. And again, you set these out in your multipliers tab in your spreadsheet. Um, one final point about this slide is you'll see from the um, description, I explain how to work these multipliers out if you don't have table A6. All that table A6 is, is a combination of tables 35 and 36. Uh, as you now know, Dan explained it in his webinar, table 36 gives the multiplier to use for a set period of time a term certain. So here the terms certain are one year, four years and 10 years. Table 35 is the factor to discount a multiplier by in the event that a loss will not occur until X years into the future. So here it's three years, four years and eight years respectively. When you combine those two tables, it gives you your multiplier. Again, I would suggest that you read through the worked example on the slide um, in your own time. Then if we go on to the next slide, you will see that the tricky bit is working out the multipliers and the claim itself is very simple to set out. Um, you simply take the cost from the care report and multiply it by your new multipliers. When Penny turns 50, 
uh, it's anticipated that her care needs are going to increase uh, inevitably. Um, and in particular, in Kenny's, Penny's case, uh, she's going to need double up care, which, as the name suggests, is where she'll have two carers, at least for some of the time, if not all the time. Now, before we look at um, the specific requirements that Penny has, uh, Ben, what do we need to be thinking about when we uh, consider the costs of double up care? This can be a, a really uh, controversial part of uh, the claim, because if a claimant is able to establish the need for um, two carers rather than one, uh, that necessarily uh, doubles the cost of care um, over uh, that um, time period. Um, the need for double up care will inevitably uh, vary from um, client to, to client. Um, I always think when I've got my claimant hat on uh, that a good starting point um, is the manual handling regulations. Um, so if you've got a claimant who requires um, a lot of hoisting or um, turning at night um, and you can get your um, case manager to arrange a manual handling assessment that says it is simply unsafe for those carers um, to uh, handle uh, that claimant um, on their own, um, then it will be hard for a defendant to argue against the principle um, that two carers are required. Um, there are, of course, more uh, nuanced cases, um, and a paraplegia case such as Penny's is, is likely to fall into that uh, category, uh, where you've got a claimant, uh, relatively young, um, who can do an awful lot um, for themselves. And indeed, um, a, a lot of paraplegics in Penny's positions are, uh, find that they can be um, uh, wholly independent in a, in a, in a number of um, tasks. But there may well still be those times of um, illness or particular activities um, that would require um, double up care. Um, and there are various ways in which you can approach that. Again, you might um, uh, decide that you're going to formulate your case on the basis that that care is a certain requirement at various times of the week and allow for double up care during those periods. Um, or you might add in a contingency uh, for uh, double up uh, care uh, over certain periods, almost being a, a prime example. Um, the recoverability of all of this again comes back to the concept of uh, reasonableness. Um, a claimant, of course, is entitled to be put in the position that he or she was in uh, prior to the accident, and so far as a court is able to do so uh, through the means of compensation. Um, and um, taking um, some examples, um, a, a claimant, of course, is entitled to live his or her um, life um, and engage in activities um, of their own volition uh, and not at the behest of um, carer availability. Um, so. Um, it, as I had in a recent case, if a um, claimant uh, needs two carers in order to interact with his children or her children, um, and uh, that need can arise at all times of day, uh, that can be another justification for um, double up care being available for 24 hours, um, even if the need per se does not arise for the totality of that 24 hour period. Um, these are all important issues to explore with the case manager and explore with the case manager uh, and care experts um, in conference. Um, and, and this is where um, we as lawyers really um, earn our money so as to ensure that the claimant uh, recovers um, properly if you've got your um, claimant hat on so that their needs are, are appropriately met. And of course, similarly, if you've got your defendant hat on, um, ensuring that these needs are in fact um, reasonable um, uh, so as to protect um, the client's um, interests accordingly. Thanks, Ben. And on the next slide, we've got Penny's particular example um, from age 50 to 60, when her care expert has advised she will need some double up care. Um, so, Anna, do you want to just explain how you worked this bit of the schedule out, which is Penny's phase from age 50 to 60? Yes, um, there's actually very little to explain here because uh, you simply set out each item as per the care report, um, as we have done uh, in the previous examples, and then use the age 50 to 60 multiplier, which is 10.43, um, and you have your future care costs calculated. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I just did one row in this, 
example, for, for the whole annual cost, when in reality, in my actual schedule, I would itemise um, it all as I have done in previous examples. So that's considered all of Penny's needs up until she turns 60. Um, but after that point, she's going to start needing care at night. Uh, ben, what are the general points we need to consider when thinking about the cost of care at night? Well, um, the, the core difference that needs to be um, considered, I suppose, A, whether night care is required at all. Um, but in a case such as this, what one suspects likely. Uh, then you need to look at the type of no, uh, night care that is required. And that broadly falls into two categories. Uh, a sleep-in carer um, is the first category, or the um, second category being a waking night carer. Um, a sleep-in carer um, essentially does what it says on the tin, is expected to um, be available, uh, but is likely to spend the night shift essentially um, sleeping, uh, perhaps getting up on ad hoc occasions um, to tend to a claimant's needs. Um, a waking night carer, again, uh, does what is said on the tin. Uh, that carer would be expected to get up on a number of occasions throughout the night uh, to meet um, the claimant's uh, needs. In fact, more likely would be awake um, for the uh, night, um, looking after um, the claimant's uh, needs. There is um, a, a threshold, really, um, that um, helps establish whether a carer is likely to be a sleeping carer or a waking night carer. Uh, in general terms, uh, when this point has been considered by the courts, um, it's been determined in this way, um, specifically that if a carer is likely to be disturbed more than two to three times a night on a regular basis, they flip from being a sleeping carer to a carer who needs to be paid um, the full waking night rate. Um, I won't get into the um, mechanics as to why, but essentially it's because um, from that point of time onwards, they're having insufficient rest under the working time um, regulations. Um, the core difference in terms of quantification is that a sleeping carer who is expected to be asleep will be paid at six hours for a 10 hour um, shift on the basis that they're um, not paid for the periods where they can be expected to be um, sleeping. Um, whereas a waking night care is paid for the full 10 hours. So um, where there's a debate between sleeping and waking night, um, you're really talking about an extra four hours care per day, of course, um, eight hours per day if it's double up. Um, but um, that's the core difference. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Well, that leads us into our last calculation for Penny's care costs, which run from the age of 60 until her expected um, date of death. So again, Anna, um, this is relatively straightforward, but if you just want to explain what we're looking at on our screen. Yes, um, just for this example, uh, we chose waking night care. Uh, so the costings are for a waking night carer. And again, simply take the annual cost from the care report and multiply it by the rest of life multiplier from your multipliers tab, uh, which for Penny is 16.14. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. And that brings us to the end of care course. And now we'll move on to case management courses. Ben, uh, what is the role of a case manager? What do they do for the injured client? Uh, and how will those costs be uh, reflected in the schedule of loss? Well, in a catastrophic case, um, a case manager is absolutely um, instrumental. Um, they will come from a variety of um, backgrounds. Um, some will be occupational therapists. Some might be physios. Um, some might be nurses. Um, some might be social workers. And they will have experience, if you find the right case manager, of dealing with specific types of injury. So some may specialise in spinal injury, some may specialise um, in brain injury, some may specialise in um, uh, injuries um, to, to children. Um, and what they really do is take that level of expertise um, and organise um, everything or um, manage the case. Um, that will include um, setting up the care package, um, setting up therapies, um, setting up 
a rehabilitation programme, um, managing the carers um, on site um, during the earlier stages of um, a care regime, um, with twofold um, benefits, really. The, the, the first, obviously, is to take um, the pressure off um, family members, um, who, of course, are uh, very often will, will, will not have experienced anything uh, like these events in their lives before. Uh, so they, they don't have to um, face um, the additional burden of, of dealing both with um, a catastrophic injury um, a, a, and managing um, a, a regime which um, that they are not expert in. Uh, and secondly, just that's it, to, to gain the benefit of the expertise of the case manager. Um, and as Anna was saying earlier, um, where you are looking to trial things and see what works and what doesn't, um, case manager can be absolutely instrumental um, in that process. Um, so that's roughly speaking what they do. And then they stay with the claimant um, after the case is settled as well. Um, so as to ensure that um, the care package is maintained and those therapies and rehabilitation continues. Thanks, Ben. Um, and how's that gonna look for Penny's case specifically? Well, um, once again, um, a good care expert will do the job for you. So you can see here um, in the left-hand column, um, and these figures are all taken from a typical um, care report. Um, you, you've got the, the recommendations of the care experts in respect of case management. This is entirely typical where you have a lot of case management at the very start. That's often when you're settling a claimant into their um, new home and getting the um, care regime in place. And then that will taper down to a what might be termed as a maintenance level of um, case management um, once things have been set up. So it's not unusual to have year one costs um, that are quite high, uh, year two costs a little bit lower, um, and then um, costs for the rest of life uh, running at a lower rate um, again. And it's a simple calculation, number of hours times an hourly rate uh, plus expenses to give you a multiple cans. And then you split the multipliers um, in the appropriate way um, using the methods that have been explained by way of reinforcements time and time again, uh, both in the first seminar and this seminar. Thanks very much, Ben. And now, before we finish off the seminar, let's just quickly look at periodic payment orders or PPOs. In brief, uh, a PPO provides that the defendant will pay the claimant an agreed sum, usually on an annual basis, until the end of her life. Anna, can you tell us about using PPOs to settle a claim like pennies? Yes, as you've said, a PPO provides an annual payment for the claimant for the rest of her life. And it removes the worry about making a lump sum payment for care based on an estimated life expectancy stretch if the claimant outlives the estimate. Uh, PPOs will continue for however long Penny lives. The index used is ASHI 6115. ASHI stands for the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings. And index 6115 is the survey of carers' wages. Uh, the percentile you link to should be the percentile of earners that most closely approximates to the hourly rate awarded by the court or agreed by the parties in your case. But in reality, it will almost always be the 80th percentile that is used. And that is what we will use for Penny. Uh, Penny will need to take advice from an independent financial advisor before making her choice whether to claim a lump sum or a PPO for her future care and case management. Uh, and if she does opt for periodical payments, uh, her annual payment will be the 15th of December each year. Next slide, please, Karen. <laughs> uh, so in practical terms, uh, calculating the PPO. Uh, when you've finalised your schedule, which as you know by now, we have done for Penny on a lump sum basis so far, you need to remove the lump sum claim for future care and case management. In Penny's schedule, it's over 4.2 million. Assuming this is the only part of her claim for which periodical payments are sought, what remains in your schedule once you've removed this uh, will be your baseline lump sum. 
Now, in keeping with our back to basics brief, um, all you need to know about the claim for periodical payments, assuming that the claim was settled on the basis of penny schedule as drafted, is that from age 40, Penny will receive £41,346 per year. She'll receive £82,042 per year from age 50 and £134,533 per year from age 60 for life. There is a final slide which we are not going to go through today. But if you want to know how to divide the PPOs to reflect that Penny turns 40, 50 and 60 in the May of each year, but doesn't receive her increased PPO until December of that year, uh, just read through that slide um, at your leisure. And in terms of the additional care payments during the childcare years, you can choose to claim them as an increased periodical payment once Penny has had her child, or you can negotiate that part of the care claim as a lump sum payment. One final point um, is that a key trap not to fall into is to fail to claim as a lump sum payment the amount needed for care and case management between the date of settlement and the first PPO. So on the next slide, um, this is the calculation uh, which fills that gap. Penny's case settles on the 1st of September 2021. It's 105 days until she will receive her first periodical payment. The amount she needs for care and case management in the first year is £89,960. So if you divide this by 365, that tells you the daily cost and then multiply it by 105 um, to show that Penny will need £24,440 as a lump sum for her agency care to tie her over until the periodical payments begin in December. So as already was discussed in seminar one, um, Dan certainly prefers to use uh, Excel rather than Word. Um, but Anna, I can see on the screen now we've got uh, your spreadsheet. Could you talk us through the advantages that you find with Excel? Yes, all my schedules are prepared in Excel. You'll see this is the uh, summary page. Um, if I hover over the future care and case management, you will see in this box up here uh, that it has been linked to the future care and case management tab. This is the multipliers page. Um, Dan took us through the table 36 uh, method for calculating the lifetime multiplier. Um, you'll recall he also touched upon the table two method and Penny's multiplier uh, before interpolation, it would have been 37.96. So let's say you're in your JSM and the defendant wants to use 37.96 as the lifetime multiplier and you want to see what difference that makes to your costings. In your multiplier tab, you simply have to change the lifetime multiplier to 37.96. And if you keep your eye on row 18 from age 60 for life, when I press enter, you will see um, that changing the lifetime multiplier will then change your final split multiplier. I will change it back uh, for a second while I show you the future care and case management tab. You will see in the section for age 60 for the rest of life, um, your multiplier box is linked to your multipliers page and it was 6.14 in our schedule. Now what happens if you want to tap in 37.96, 
you will see that it has changed the multiplier to 15.64. It's therefore changed the total because you had it set up uh, to do the multiplication for you. It's changed the total here. It will have changed your total for care there. It's also changed that to uh, 4.1 million from 4.2 million. And then if you go to your summary page, it has pulled your new total through so you can see what your new lump sum is. That is why it's so important to just have all your uh, tabs lined up and your formula set up correctly because all I had to do was change that one number in this box and my entire schedule has recalculated itself. Um, and as well as how easy it makes it when you're in negotiations and numbers are flying back and forth, you need to be able to do that really quickly and tell your client what difference a defendant's offer has made to the total value of their claim. Great, well, thanks so much for that. Anna, I think that was a very useful and really clear demonstration of why Excel is so much better for this than Word would be. Uh, typing in the number in one place and everything feeding through, certainly far preferable to <laughs> trying to do those calculations again from scratch and typing them in on every part of a Word document uh, where it fed in. Um, and thanks again to you both, both to Ben and to Anna. That was hugely um, interesting and hugely useful. Um, presentation from you both. I know I've learned an awful lot just by doing this recording from you um, and we're all incredibly grateful for your time so thank you. Absolute pleasure. Very welcome. I'm a huge schedule enthusiast so um, it is no problem at all for me to try and share some knowledge. <laughs> and I show everyone your mug. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. That's what we need to know. <laughs> yeah. We've got to get some schedule school merch, and that's gonna be that's gonna be first up. Yeah, but thank you both so much. Um, and like I said at the beginning, Anna and Ben have produced this Excel um schedule for us. It's up on the website, so is the care report. So you can use those um at your leisure. Um so so please do use them. Um, and also if you have any questions or comments or feedback from today um, please do find us um on Twitter. I'm at Hunt Karen and Ollie is at Omay Days. Um, so please let us know um what questions you have what feedback you have um, and stay tuned for the next seminar in schedule school which is going to be all about aids and equipment so not one to miss thank you again to all our guests and goodbye <laughs>